the most popular group of pieces in the children's album are the four little gems that take us all around the world. We go to France, we go to Germany, and we go to Italy twice because that may have been Tchaikovsky's favorite place. We will start with the little Italian song, which may be the most popular song in the entire volume. The Italian song is based on a tune Tchaikovsky heard a boy sing outside his window in Italy. It's a simple love song, but it moved Tchaikovsky deeply. We know that from his letters. The piece itself is one of the easier ones to play from the album, mostly because the left hand basically repeats the formula. But from teaching experience, I know that kids get stuck on a number of issues here. So let's take them each in turn. Let's start with the left hand. The left hand, until the end, follows a fairly simple um chong chong um chong chong formula. Which needs to be kept very quiet to avoid the following. One gets that a lot in lessons. It is very difficult to play staccato quietly, so we have to work on it quite a bit. Once again, if you've seen um, any of my earlier videos in this series, you know I'm always recommending playing from the surface of the key when we want a quiet sound to avoid accidental thumping. Touch the key. Of course, the bass notes don't necessarily need to be quiet. We need them for the rhythm, for, for the lilt, and for the harmony. Did you notice the fingering that I use here, where I put my thumb on both the G and the A? This is recommended by many editions, and I recommend it very highly. Many people can, in fact, reach playing this with one and two, but I think it will be much more difficult to keep the pianissimo that we need. This is fun to do and easy. The right hand, on the other hand, needs to be played with a great deal of cantabile sound, a singing tone, since this is based on the song. We need to do that by reaching deep into the keys on the one hand. Absolutely no hitting, of course. Instead, let's use our arm to really phrase for us. Let's move our wrist in the direction of the melody and then lift at the end. Did you see? I barely need to add any phrasing or any dynamics to this because my arm does the singing. Yes, it is possible to achieve this effect with fingers alone. But we shouldn't do so. Let me tell you why. If you look at our hand, you can see that all our fingers are different lengths. Even when we curve them, they are still coming down at slightly different angles. In order to achieve really beautiful sound, we don't particularly want to curve them either. We would like to use the cushy, fat part of our fingers so more of the finger goes down on the key. So if the fingers are more or less straight, they are truly different lengths, so it is very important to turn your hand towards the short finger to allow it to have as much power and as much control as the long fingers. So in other words, when you play the third finger, you're going to be straight, and when you play the pinky, you're going to be out to the right, and when you play the thumb, you're going to be over to the left. This creates a beautiful line. is played this way because we hear from the mother of one of Liszt's students who took down notes during lessons that what Liszt said is that the fingers are to be used as spokes of a wheel and the wrist then becomes the rim. Let's follow in the footsteps of the best. The next big problem in the Italian song is the dotted rhythm. For whatever reason the dotted rhythm is very difficult for young pianists to understand, even though it is really quite mathematically straightforward, especially here. One, two, 
two, three, four, one, right? If you've seen my earlier videos, you know that very often in pieces that are dance or march-like, I recommend over dotting. Instead of three to one, something more like six to one or even more. But this piece represents a song, not a dance, so the over dotting doesn't really work. I would recommend staying absolutely even. If we do that, then we can explain to the student the way the math works here. One, two, three, four, one is the way I teach it. If counting doesn't work, we can subdivide. And then we can subdivide mentally. Then we can stop wiggling about and just count again in our head. Once the dotted rhythms have settled themselves down, we can start noticing more fascinating details in the text. For example, look at the second phrase. Notice the little staccato and pick up right in the middle of it. How absolutely charming. I suggest exaggerating the lift just a little bit instead of just coming off of the key Come up an intercept that will make the next note a smidgen late, which is, I think, exactly the effect Tchaikovsky is looking for. Another marvelous detail that appears in the middle section of the piece is 16 notes, which have rather complicated articulation markings. This business. Right? We have a two note slur followed by staccatos. Staccato is one of my favorite subjects and obviously one of Tchaikovsky's favorite subjects because there's so much of it in the album. In this case, the best kind of a staccato to use, I think, is the simple one where you scratch the key with your finger, starting, as usual, very near the key. in this section from students is that instead of a two-note slur, they connect three notes like this. First of all, it doesn't obey the text, but also it doesn't have quite the same charm. There's something so flirtatious about this measure, if done right. So even though in most editions, at the end of the two notes slur, there is no dot. We can just put one in. Uh, yes, we can think of a uh, two notes slur as a gentle sort of wrist down now, but in this case, on 16th notes, there is no time to do that. So that the second note of the two notes slur really is staccato. In other words, every measure, one long note and five short ones. Now that we've got the details under control, we can think about phrasing. If you play slowly, you need to phrase over a small area. For example, the first four measures. Lovely. If you're a little faster, perhaps the first four measures can be crescendo and the next four measures can be a diminuendo. can be crescendo and the next eight can go down. I honestly don't even have a favorite. I think they're all delightful. The idea is to create an interpretation that is completely and thoroughly traditional area of difficulty here is the ending. Tchaikovsky puts in um, sort of irregular um, ties and slurs and it's sort of difficult to understand for a student exactly what to do. In theory what we have is this and then the left 
Belgian pixel plays the pinky again. And then here, the left hand will play its thumb and sit on it and tie it into the next measure. I would love to hear a legato in the right hand as well, so that we're holding on to the top notes and playing the last notes. This is all very difficult for a young child to process. So my suggestion would be, uh, rather than sacrifice the smoothness and the beauty of the ending, I would sacrifice that final tie in the left hand, if completely necessary. We'll just not notice it. I hope I've answered a lot of your questions. If you have more, please leave them in the comments. Happy practicing!